Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Jordan, um, and um, I'm, I guess I'm best known because I write for Forbes about parenting and education and video games and, um, you know, and play in general. Um, but I'm, I'm also the father of two little boys uh, who are seven and nine. And I teach at, I teach at uh, Intellectual Heritage at Temple University in Philadelphia. And I'm telling you that one in particular because um, one, of the re one of the reasons that I do what I do um, and why, why I'm here and why, why I work with video game companies and, and toy companies and, and work and consult and all this kind of stuff and, and speak about it regularly is, is because I, I enter this from a philosophical perspective. That's where my background is. My background's in philosophy. And, and my big question is, is how structures that, 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 that we all participate in shape the way we see the world, right? Um, obviously they do. So, so how does that happen? Um, which means, if we understand that and we have some control over it, then we can also shape the world we see, right? Which means we shape the whole world. So I'm saying that to just point out the reason that I think all of us are here is social impact, right? We're, we're all, all of us on this panel are here because we're really interested in, in cultural or social change um, and, and, and how and how play, I'll start with play is the word, uh, how, how play impacts that, how play, how play cre creates that. And, um, and, and, and play, both play spaces, toys, how we play, how we think about our lives playfully, how that can have real impact on, on, on what our world looks like. Now, I'm, I just told you all I'm a, I'm a philosophy guy, right? So I can only talk about this in big, abstract ways, right? I can't talk about this in practical ways, which is why <laughs> all of these people are here uh, to talk about what that looks like on a real practical level, on, and, and specifically on a city level for, the, for this panel, right? How, how cities can, can, can start to do that kind of social change through play. I really don't know these people very well. I met mean, them I mean, I mean, this morning, I'll say that from the beginning, but the advantage for all of you is that is that that means this is a learning panel. I don't think any of us are here to kind of be presenters. We're not here to say this is what we do. Um, we're, we're, we're here to kind of just kind of play with ideas together. Um, so that, that's what the panel is going to look like. Um, and I'm going to start by asking everyone to just introduce themselves. I'm not going to do the formal, this is this person. But when you introduce yourselves, guys, do this. Don't do what I just did, where I said, I'm Jordan and I work for Forbes. That's boring. Okay, what I want to know is I want to know like why you're here, like what what, you're, what, what drives you to be interested in this? Why, what's your passion, right? Why are you passionate about play, about playful spaces, about social impact, all of these things? And then, and then, and only after that do I want to know how that manifests in your workaday life, okay? Um, why don't we start, Sally? Great, hi, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Sally McConnell, I work for Kaboom. Uh, and I have a question for, for the audience. Um, who has kids? Stand up. Stand up. Uh, stand up. Who knows kids? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I might have to sit down. <laughs> who has been a kid? Who's All right, good. just check. Just check. <laughs> um, so we have passion for play. I have personal passion for play. Uh, Coming to Kaboom a couple of months ago was an encore career for me, uh, and I decided that I had an opportunity before I spent all of my free time playing, kayaking, riding my bike, uh, to do something at a real level to affect ultimately behavior change and norm change. And that's really the business that Kaboom's in. We're going to talk about that today as we talk about a term, Gwen, our North Star, which we call playability, and really. Uh, introduce you to folks that we admire um, and whose work we, we try to shine a spotlight on to show uh, what is happening at the city le level and how cities are really a laboratory for innovation and how play, while not the solution to every one of societal's pro problems, is a thread that runs through so much of what can be done to create active bodies active minds, active together, active communities. We think a lot about balance, uh, and I appreciate the comments that were uh, referred to that. And we think about terms like play everywhere. It was thrilling to hear Greg and Bob yesterday talk about play everywhere, and we're gonna show uh, today some examples of what that really means. 
but just some context setting from my on my perspective and and um, and then a little bit of a background into why we think this is such an imperative. You know, you guys have heard, we were talking about yesterday, that 90% of all parents think play is important. And actually, according to our friends at the Lego Foundation, that number has crept up to 93% of folks that care about kids and take care of kids and are involved in kids' lives think, think play is important, and yet play is declining. Um, and that is an enormous generational societal issue. The consequences of that are profound. Um, we see uh, it manifests in, in health issues related to children, obesity, higher blood pressure, inability to manage toxic stress. We talked yesterday about declining resilience in kids. We talked about lack of creativity. And this is, the result of this is that our kids aren't going to be prepared for the 21st century skills that they need to navigate. So we at Kaboom think about scale. Um, you, many of you I think know our CEO and founder, Daryl Hammond, and I think you heard him talk last year. And, and during that talk he was talking, he mentioned a fairly significant seismic strategic shift that our organization was making. And that's because after being in the place, the world for almost 20 years, we realized that we could not solve this problem at the scale that it exists. I mean, Kaboom has done amazing things, in my opinion, I can say that because I'm fairly new to the team, but in 18 years, Kaboom has built or funded or assisted the development of 16,000 playgrounds in the United States. Yeah. Touch the lives of 7.4 million kids, and yet, as I said, we've now gone through a generation of kids that aren't playing. So, what's going on, and uh, what does that what does that mean, and how does that set the stage for what you'll hear from colleagues on the panel? We want to understand that too. So, 93% of parents say play is important. People aren't playing. What's the deal? Um, and we are engaged in a very interesting research project with Ideas 42. They're a behavioral economics firm. They study uh, barriers to, to, to action. And they're coming forward with some interesting hypotheses. And we'll be releasing uh, that study in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I am going to hint at some things. It's kind of common sense stuff. Parents don't think about, kids don't think about play as a destination, OK? Kids think about playing everywhere. Parents think that play is a destination. That's a barrier, because it's a hassle, right? How, how do you fit that in, and when do you make time, and gosh, what if it's cold, and what if you have to put a snowsuit on, or, you know, there's just lots of things. One, two, low-income families, and we care and focus on most of our work on 16 million American kids who live in poverty. Low-income families spend a tremendous amount of time waiting. They're in lines. They have the kids at the bus stops, right? They have kids uh, waiting. Uh, and so what are the opportunities there to create a true essence of play everywhere? How do we make play, which is the smart choice, the easy choice for families? So what we think about is that that's a standard that cities could, could aspire to, a standard of playability, innovation, around infrastructure and investment and creative coalition building could in fact yield dramatic change at the city level that makes cities more attractive to kids and families. And what our friends here uh, will tell you from Kenmore, Washington and San Francisco is that that uh, is really smart economic development thinking. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and just say that um, it's wonderful, uh, Charlie and Richard, for you to have us here. We really appreciate you uh, giving this opportunity. It's incredibly smart to pick San Francisco as the site of this conference, because it is a playful city. Yeah. It's one of 212 <coughs> playful American cities that we recognize every year. And Mayor Baker represents another one of those cities, Kenmore. Our friend Joan from Morgan Stanley will tell you a lot about the investment that's uh, important um, in, in cities and the result, uh, the ripple effect. 
effect of that. And um, I guess I'll just sort of stop there. I've gone into my little soliloquy, but uh, you can tell I have some passion. <laughs> Um, John Steinberg, Morgan Stanley, and I know you all thought investment bank, games, fun, excitement. Um, uh, but actually, I think that I was included on the panel to to show that you don't have to be in the industry of play to understand and support where playability is affecting change in society. So, in like two seconds, our foundation focuses on kids' health, and we're really focused on the basic building and fundamental building blocks that kids need for an early, healthy start in life. And it really is about health. So we got into play from the form of physical activity, frankly, and introduction on obesity. But we quickly figured out how much play is integrated with other health needs. So for us, we concentrate on safe places to, to play. We also concentrate on regular access to food and healthy food at that, and access to medical care and quality medical care. Um, so I would just definitely have you, as you think about your social responsibility hats, um, move off of just where this is about games and delivery of games and play, but how it's really integrated into the tapestry of a whole community and the poorest members of those communities and how you how it's a part of the lift up on the on the greater aspect. So I'm happy to talk to you about what that is, but that, that's why I'm here, even though it seems really odd. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Baker. I'm David Baker. I'm the mayor of the city of Kenmore, Washington, which is, uh, if any of you are familiar with the area, there's a big lake in the middle of uh, of the Seattle area, and we're uh, the crown of the lake, the north end of the lake, we're the jewel. Um, <laughs> I won't say what that makes some of the other cities around the lake. Um, a number of years ago, we were voted one of the top 10 cities in the United States to raise a family. And we continue to build upon that. And we are doing everything we can possibly do to make our city more playable, more family friendly, to, uh, to attract um, the young adults and the young children. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do when we built a new city hall was put a play area in front of the city hall with water features and whatever, um, so kids would be able to in the summertime run in and splash and play. Um, one of the older council members indicated, well, we don't kids running through City Hall. <laughs> Our city manager, who is, is quite young himself, uh, and I, I mean, that's exactly what we want. We want the sound of children playing. So uh, we're, we're, we're making slow progress, in, uh, but we're taking very, very positive steps to uh, build upon uh, the things that we've learned over the years. And I hope to be sharing some of that with you today. Nope. All right, Jordan, I'm going to try to answer the question, frame my introduction as you asked us to. Uh, my name is Phil Ginsberg. I love play. Uh, I love cities. Uh, I, I consider myself a, a, a bit of an urbanist. I live in San Francisco. I am raising my kids in San Francisco. I believe play is fundamentally critical to helping families thrive, particularly those families that live in big cities and I run San Francisco's Recreation and Park Department. Mm -hmm. And our city is really undergoing a renaissance in play for a variety of reasons um, uh, right now, um, in part um, because of our park system, which is a truly fabulous park system. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we, are, we have had the good fortune of being able to renovate parks and playgrounds and ball fields all over town. Uh, we, are, we have focused a lot on programming our public spaces. Hopefully you've all been, been able to enjoy San Francisco a little bit, for those of you that, that don't live here. But also because our demographics are changing. Um, we are, uh, for the first time, seeing an influx of, of younger folks as the tech community has, is growing in San Francisco. We're seeing younger people who are beginning to raise families in San Francisco. And so play becomes more important generationally as well. Um, I, uh, truth be told, uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade, so what am I doing at the table? Uh, I ended, uh, I, I've had the great fortune, uh, after a, a, a long career in a variety of things, of running San Francisco's Recreation Park Department for the last um, five years, but I, I didn't get to the job as, as a horticulturalist or as a recreation professional. I got it as a customer and as a user of our parks and programs and somebody who really sort of enjoys and relishes 
uh, and thrives on play. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Um, I guess I really want to start with, we have this slide that keeps coming up um, <laughs> of playability. Um, and it's got a really nice one sentence definition, but doesn't really answer the question of what it is, right? Um, I mean, it's a great one sentence definition, but to answer that, it takes more than one sentence. So I, I guess I'll start because it, it, it's a word coined by Kaboom. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about this word playability? I mean, we hear the word bikeability and walkability when talking about cities all the time, but, but how, how do they relate? Because you can't just build like a play track, <laughs> right? Like you can build a bike trail. Um, well, who's heard of the term bikeability? And who's heard of the term walkability? And does anyone just want to shout out, shout out what you think that means when you're thinking about a city? Anybody? How easy it is to do, how easy it is to, to do that. And, and what, what audience do you think that, the, that, that those terms are sort of directed at? What, what segment? Adults. Adults, right. So, so we think that there's a, uh, an opportunity to create this phrase playability and to socialize it and to push it out there as a standard for cities to aspire to, as a way of describing what a playful city could be like. And we're not in the business of prescribing the, the solution. We're in the business of raising up awareness and trying to spotlight innovation and people that really are on the ground and understand what's going to work for their city um, to make it, it playable. So we have that recognition program I mentioned. Um, we're also looking at potentially funding a play prize of some signif significance to in incent people to come forward. And we're constantly in the coalition building world looking to connect folks. We have a summit in October where we'll bring uh, 20 team cities, lead cities from around the country who are going to spend a day in a workshop just sharing ideas and learning from each other to try to seed innovation and change and take it back into their community. So that's the scale that I talked about um, and that's how we think about the term. So, as, I mean, the word we hear the most is recreation, but talk, talk to us as someone who does this the difference between a word like playability and recreation and how that changes how you might think about about planning on a city level? Well, I mean, I, I think that the um, words are certainly related. I think um, uh, playability feels to me a little bit broader. And what playability, it's the ability, what, what really resonates for me is, is accessibility and accessibility to play. How easy is it to play? How, you know, whether it's, whether it's um, you know, parks and playgrounds and ball fields, or community events and, and you know, sort of more pop-up opportunities for play. And um, so I, I feel like it's a little bit, it's a, great, it's a great term and it's a very provocative one, so I appreciate Kaboom for trying to kind of raise, raise its profile. Um, you know, living in cities is hard, right? I mean, it's not easy. And, and so for my job, we think about, you know, really as diverse as San Francisco is really only two types of, of San Franciscans. You know, those with a choice who are fortunate enough to about, uh, fortunate enough to have a choice about whether they want to raise their family in a city, and what can we do to keep them here, right, uh, as they get older. You know, in San Francisco, housing is expensive. It's hard to get your kid into the public school of your choice. It's a very dense, congested city. Um, so, what can we do to make make families with a choice stay? And playability is a, is a is a big piece of that. The other group are folks without a choice who are not blessed with either the economic luxury or uh, you know, for health reasons or cultural reasons or economic reasons or born in, in a city, will live in a city and will die in a city. And then creating playability, creating healthy opportunities and joy, it's creating joy in a city is, becomes a matter of social justice. And so I, I actually think it's a, a super important term. Mayor Baker, from, from, from the mayor's perspective, why does it matter to a city? Right, not not why does it matter to play? Why why should cities care? It's 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 a way to attract families. It's it's a way to um, attract business development. Um, we're again a small city, six square miles, and we don't have much retail. We live on on property taxes, and one of the things that we've tried to do is make our city very attractive to to parents, um, for them to want to move there, for them to want to live there. And um, we've done things from making it very, very easy to get building permits to developing all sorts of programs. We have 26 employees in our city. We don't have a parks department. 
Um, we rely on volunteers. We rely um, on a number of different mechanisms to make things happy, uh, make things happen. So one of the things that we've recently done, we've done a lot of polls throughout the years in, in the community. Um, people want access to the water. They want to be able to enjoy the lake and the river that uh, is in our community. So we just completed our first parks purchase. Um, we inherited parks from the county when we became a city, but this was our first parks purchase as waterfront land uh, with uh, capabilities to hand launch canoes and kayaks. And we have started a canoe and kayak program for children, both recreational and competitional. We have an Olympic coach who lives, a kayak coach who lives in the community, who's taken on the responsibility of coaching the kids. So we have the opportunities here for a number of children with limited financial needs to be able to enjoy this, as well as kids from, from uh, the other areas of the city. Again, six square miles is, is really not that much, but I'm telling you, the diversity that we have in our community is pretty amazing. We have $5 million houses on the lakefront. We have a trailer park right next to City Hall. Um, with some of the poorest families in, in the region. So uh, we wanted to make sure that what we did would benefit everybody, so. Joe, can you talk about the economics here? Like, you know, the, the, both the, the impact and the, and, the, and the challenges. To some extent, I definitely think that, <laughs> I think the Mayor Baker can talk about it from a city perspective. Um, we, uh, and I'm sure there are folks at Morgan Stanley who do a better job on the formulas here because I'm not a math person. But um, what we do know is that a city really is only as healthy as its kids. Um, and what you really want to look at is the health of a city, the economic health of a city also have, is based on the health of its people. And what you want is a city that's thriving. And one of the ways a city thrives is by having families who want to stay. And we, we were having breakfast and we were saying, you know, again, I don't want to act like if you build a playground and the whole world will be better because that's just a piece of it. But I think that when you see parents wanting to stay in community and they want to raise their kids there, you start to see a better improvement in the public school system because they're invested in it. You start to see a thriving retail business because they're invested in the small shop owners in their community who they now know. And the more that people are connected in the community to each other, the more they lift each other up. And I think particularly as we've talked about people living in poverty and particularly single parent households, where you know, we all talk about parents should be playing with their kids, but that's really hard to do when you're working three jobs and you're not home. The community, I don't want to go into a Hillary Clinton mode here, but the community as it forms around these families is really critical. So I can, you know, I'm sure I can find somebody who can tell you the dollars and cents piece of this, but I think that what we're really looking at is is the strength of the community on a whole, which then leads to the economic success of the success of the community. Well, I, you know, I mean, the Trust for Public Land, there are organizations out yeah. there that actually look at the economic impact of, of parks, and, and which is a little bit of a broader topic than just play. But I mean, you know, the, the importance of talking about Playability from an economic perspective is we all, because uh, I think we all have a lot in common here, need to kind of shift the framework of investment in cities from back end investment in emergency rooms and public protection, which is very costly, to front end investment in, in parks and play, which promotes health and public safety. And there, you know, it's, you know we have, we oversee 15% of the city's land and receive less than 2% of the city's general fund. And we're no different than any other major city in, in, the, in the country in that end. And, and you know, the vast amount of your tax dollars are going towards really kind of back-end reactive services. And play, investment in play is something which really does yield a very significant economic return on investment with respect to dollars saved on the healthcare side, the dollars saved public protection side, economic development, and all of those factors. And, and there's a, there actually is a lot of data out there about that. I mean, I, I guess, uh, I'm going to turn it back to you, Joan, which is the, the, the I'm sorry, Sally, that's Joan. The, 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 like, how do I ask this, this question? <laughs> Tell us about some of these pictures, okay? That's really what I want to know because, yeah. I mean, playgrounds, we've been building playgrounds for a hundred, probably more than a hundred years and nobody's against parks, nobody's against playgrounds, but we're actually, when we're talking about playability, we're talking about something I don't want to say instead of, but in addition to, right, um, a, and a real playability, a way, a way of living, a, mind sh a, a mindset shift, a paradigm shift here. Um, um, so talk about what that looks like, and you have all these pictures that yeah. can help you. 
Um, so I'll speak to the slides because they come from some of our playful cities and they're pretty interesting and they, they reinforce a lot of what the panel's been talking about. So take this bus, right? Um, so this is from Baltimore and it was uh, their response to um, what families were telling them about the play everywhere, the enormous frustration they felt um, waiting at the bus stop uh, and fidgety kids and unhappy families and this ex this, this, this frustration as parents that they had all these opportunities, and this was sort of dead space in their life. So there was a really interesting competition to see how bus stops could be turned into play spaces. Um, the, the crosswalk painting is, I know, something we are bankers thinking about, and a lot of cities are too. Um, and you know what? That doesn't take any additional resource. It takes a different mind. That's a mindset shift. That's a, hey, we're going to repaint the crosswalks. It's coming up in our annual whatever budget. You tell me the terms, I don't know. Why don't we do hopscotch? Why don't we do this? And so you start to see that happening more and more. This is the kind of idea sharing I'm talking about. This is also great for families because it's a trigger, right? Back to the behavioral barriers. It's like, oh, right, well, we're walking to school and we're taking the game. Gosh, we can all engage in this fun game. And, um, uh, so so that, that's, that's one. And then um, I think, Phil, you talked about um, op excuse me, opportunities to um, sort of uh, invigorate uh, dead spaces, you know, pop-up play opportunities. Uh, again, relevance to people's everyday lives, triggers to incent the behavior, playful behavior begets more play, ultimately leads to the to the norm change. So uh, this this is, I think, from Memphis. It's just an example of ways that that city was using uh, sort of abandoned uh, lots and access to, to waterfront. And, and I'll end with something I don't have a picture of, but I thought was just brilliant. Um, the mayor of Auburn, Maine, told me that they had really fabulous waterfront and they they didn't have any money, but they reclaimed what they could, and they just saw all kinds of people coming back um, to the river in the summer, and Maine's really nice in the summer. It's really freezing and miserable in the winter, and there was just this incredible frustration because nobody could get outside even on a nice wintry day, and then they figured out that they were shoveling the wrong sidewalks, and if they reallocated resources and focus, on the pathways and the sidewalks that led to the riverfront, um, everything changed about their city and it became playable in the winter. So just smart, smart creative thinking. Yeah, yeah. and it's, a, you know, I want, I want to add something here because we don't have an education person on, on this panel, and so I'll fill that in as best that, that I can, which, which is, which you've talked about a lot of benefits and the health benefits, and everyone in this room, of course, is, is, is in favor of it, or else they wouldn't be in, in, in this room. Um, but, you know, we've all heard of the word gap. I'm sure everybody here has heard of, of, of the word gap, talking about the, the vocabulary gap between low-income children and higher-income children, which is gigantic. Um, what, what they don't talk much about in the media is that a lot of that begins in the everyday walk down the street, in that the, the, the high-income family, when they walk down the street, mom or dad says to the child, um, you know, look at the pretty white snow, right? Um, and the, and the, and, and the low-income family says, don't step in that, right? So, so it becomes a lot about adjectives, and adjectives are playful ways of making sense in our life. So you know, I, I think about that bus stop, and I think about how the language and the conversation that would, that would develop around those playful spaces, and how much impact that would even have in terms of, of literacy and, and, and thinking, which I just wanted to say that myself, because we don't have anyone on here to, to talk about that perspective, and I'm certainly not the expert on that perspective, but, but I can bring it. Uh, then I also want to, turn to Mayor Baker and say, again, we're in a room full of people. We're preaching to the choir, <laughs> obviously, in this room. We wouldn't all be here. What are the obstacles? Um, people. <laughs> <laughs> we have people in our community. They're, they're bananas. They build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. Um, we, we tried to, to put a park in not too long ago, and we had found that uh, people had moved their fences into the park. They had 
put little bridges over the fences and put lawn chairs into our park. Okay. When we wanted to put in a play area, um, they didn't like the idea that the kids would be running and playing and screaming and having fun, that the noise would disturb them. Um, we had envisioned a $60,000, $70,000 investment. By the time we got done, it was over $900,000 because of all sorts of things. So there can be huge obstacles. Uh, another example was uh, a group came to us and wanted some ball fields. We don't have that many ball fields in our community for Little League Baseball, yet we do have a lot of children in the community. So there was a uh, there is a state park in our community, and we wanted to invest uh, seven or eight hundred thousand dollars in the state park and rehab some ball fields. Um, it ended up that uh, when we were in front of the state parks commission, because of people who live around the park, state parks commission told us that it is not state parks' responsibility to provide opportunities for play for the public. So I kind of have been shaking my head ever since. <laughs> works supposed to do. <laughs> so there, there's obstacles. I mean, obviously there's financial obstacles. You know, you got you got streets to maintain. Um, we've got uh, because we're a small city, we contract with with King County Sheriff's Department. We get uh, 12, 13 off, uh, officers out of that. Uh, we have the lowest crime rate of any city around us, three and a half million dollars a year. So that really cuts into our budget. So um, those are some of the obstacles that cities run into. I would just add to that quick, because again, we're coming from the outside, and here's where I think that you're all sitting in a power seat, is there's silos also in the way that people are thinking about what they're doing for kids in the community. So the hospital's concentrating on <coughs> medical testing or health awareness, and the food bank is talking about getting healthy food, and the parks department or recreation department might be thinking about play, and they're not, talking to each other by design. And one of the great things that you can do as a public sector person, a private sector person, is come in, frankly get to be a little bit, you know, Mr. Moneybags, and say, I actually want you guys to talk to each other, because it's just enough incentive sometimes to get them to peek over the wall of the silo and work with each other. But it's not, <laughs> but unfortunately, by design, their goals and their missions sometimes, even though they overlap, don't look alike. And it's very hard sometimes. And I and I, I we do a lot of work in schools. Don't ever exclude the school. I know it's really hard, and there's under so much pressure. But they're actually so focused on achievement for their kids. If you will give them a free resource that's going to make their kids better and smarter and cognitively developed, they'll take it. They just they're not going to be able to sit and build it. So I think that you know we've actually uh, found that to be successful. But getting everyone to sit in a room and kind of put their own agenda aside for a second takes a little push. For us, we found that walking in with a big swing and, you know, bank name helps. But as somebody who's in the private sector, you have that capability right away. So often gov uh, government is structured that way. Um, in Washington State, I know other areas of the country, cities have nothing to do with the schools. The schools have their own school boards. The cities have their own form of government. Hospital districts have their own form. And it is very important to get people in the same room. And we try to do that in Kenmore. Every year we try to have a joint meeting with a couple of our neighboring cities, plus the, board, uh, the school board and uh, the hospital board when we can, to try to bring everybody together so we're all working on the same page. I would say get them in the same sandbox. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Listening to these two. Uh, well, I, I think very optimistically about San Francisco's ability to um, cross uh, silos of particular departments or agencies. I actually think we're doing a very good job of it. We work incredibly closely with San Francisco Unified School District, for example, which is a you know a separate constitutional entity in California. Um, but yet we have a shared schoolyard program where they where we are partnering with the school district to make sure everybody every schoolyard is open on the weekends to create more community and opportunities for play. We work very closely with our health department, uh, our Department of Public Works on activating streets. Uh, we have a great program in San Francisco called Sunday Streets, uh, where we go to different neighborhoods around town and we actually close the uh, we, we close down miles of streets actually and bring play to streets. Accessibility is a big challenge. That was your initial question. Making sure that you know trans you know transportation is a barrier. Um, uh, obviously, socioeconomic status can be a barrier to to play, quite frankly. And so, what we have focused on is not just having opportunities for play where people come to us, but we've worked with these other agencies 
to go to our neighborhoods and go to our communities and go to where, where communities are so that they don't have to travel or don't have to figure out how to get some place. Uh, we have a program called Mobile Recreation where we, we actually have rock climbing wall, mountain bikes, and skateboards, and we we bring it, we rotate around the city and bring it to neighborhoods, which augments the 4,000 acres of open space that we're, we're blessed to have. Um, uh, other challenge, uh, I don't know how many of you all are from big cities, so I'm going to represent the, the big city perspective. We have 26 people. We have uh, 28,000 people working for the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, we ha I have over 1,400 staff in my department. Um, it's a big agency. Uh, parks, uh, play, play is not immune from the challenges of urban living. Um, you know, uh, graffiti, vandalism, uh, public safety, you know, families, kids have to feel safe. And if you, that is their, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that is, that is number one on the list. You've got to feel safe. And we can invest, you know, all the money in the world, thanks to Morgan Stanley and Kaboom, but if our communities are not feeling safe in their parks or safe in their environments of play, they're not going to come. And if parks aren't activated, there's going to, you're going to see more vandalism and you're going to see more damage. And it's really discouraging. It's, I mean, I don't know, I, it is the most discouraging part of my job is, is hearing, you know, all of the bad behavior that happens each night in, in, in our system. And, um, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, you know, you just keep going and you fight another fight and you fix it and move on. Um, but you also have to activate spaces, and that's the, you know, the, the last piece of my answer, which is I think we should not look at play as either um, uh, static or fixed. And, and uh, you know, this is a, a playground, you know, focused conversation in many respects. Um, but I think, uh, you know, we, we have been, did a really good job last year, uh, just a few months ago, we activated Civic Center Plaza, which is in a very difficult part of town, a lot of social services, uh, more and more housing coming to the mid-market area, but not quite there yet. And we turned our Civic Center Plaza into basically World Cup Palooza, where for a month we had thousands and thousands of people um, congregating at Civic Center to watch World Cup soccer matches on a big screen. And we had uh, uh, our own staff and nonprofits doing soccer clinics, and it was just about play. And it's activating activating existing spaces through uh, you know through events. It's a big part of play that we shouldn't uh, that we shouldn't forget. Yeah, the, the playability is, is not about putting products in cities, right? It's, it's about yeah. getting people playing. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the last, <coughs> sorry, Jordan, the yeah, last that's challenge, because I think it's a, a worthwhile topic, because yeah. for San Francisco and this panel in particular, because there are a lot of folks here from the, the tech sector, we have an amazing partnership with Zynga, I know that the, the Zynga is here today. But, but we have to really think very carefully about how we meld technology and play. The truth of the matter is, is that our children are spending more than seven and a half hours a day behind a screen and less than an hour a day outside right now. And, you know, technology is good, technology is, is here to stay, but we need to be thoughtful about how we meld it and how we make sure that our kids uh, and our communities are still touching nature. Um, and that is a, a, a continuing challenge, even in, pro, even in playground development, where, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's, old, what's out is in and what's in is out, there's now a trend, I think, as some of you may know, towards more natural playgrounds with logs and rocks and things like that. And that is basically a cry for, we've got, particularly in big cities, you know, suburbs or rural communities are a little different, but where we've got such an intense, such an intense built environment, that how do we, how do we offset that and, 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 and really create a little bit more of a natural environment for our kids to thrive? And you can solve more than one social problem in the same space. So when we do, we've done 10 playgrounds with Kaboom, or we're about to do the two extras. Um, one of the things we look for is opportunity to community gardens within the playground space. Because again, we're dealing with populations that are also by facing food insecurity and lack of fruits and vegetables, and maybe the medical awareness of what they should be eating. So we build community gardens right into the play space, and now you've got the family coming, and they're getting a secondary benefit from being. And that is the perfect way to, to a perfect example of how to meld through partnership, technology, and, and nature with with Zynga. Uh, Zynga's one of Zynga's big, big games is Farmville, right? So we are actually bringing that virtual game where Zing has been very supportive of our urban farming, the city's urban, real urban farming initiatives, and our community gardens. And, um, you know, that is a, uh, that is a, um, a successful example of, of, of how we're, we're melding tech and nature. I'm going to take questions right now, yeah. Go live. Go live. I'll just start right here. This is the first question I spray there. Um, Thank you. This is a, a great panel, and I think that 
you know, a lot of this is a much bigger cultural shift about thinking, and I love the term playability, about how do we reconfigure the culture of our cities, you know, and involves moving away from the cities built for automobiles towards cities built for human beings, less cars. San Francisco, great example, lost a highway gain in neighborhood. Um, and I think that's how we think of tuning an entire city to be playable. Um, and um, I think technology, and it doesn't have to be high tech, SMS text, that people can sign up and find out maybe there's a little extra walk, there's something special going on over here, and thinking of ways to use technology to get people out and, and connected. And definitely where people are walking, areas are safer. Where traffic isn't everywhere, there's less crime, there's more people on the streets, there's more economic activity, retail doubles when you take cars on the street. So I think there's, you know, I just, the, the, there's an enormous cultural shift that is going to take generations, but that I think that this effort is, is so critical to really rebuilding our cities. One thing I wanted, I mean, with Kaboom, it seems like there's so many brilliant ideas that we see because our cities are our laboratories. Um, and how is Kaboom, uh, and maybe this is part of the transition, and I know this is somewhat you're already doing, but really becoming a clearinghouse for these ideas so that we can open source them and the hard data about where play has been expanded and the economic benefits so that we can start building up um, the, the political will and the social will to shift our resources to much smarter investments. Um, and how, what are your plans on that? And, and really creating a portal that, that can help uh, generalize the best of what's happening the, the cheap, from the very cheap uh, repainting your, your crosswalks towards reallocating municipal budgets uh, and everything in between? Uh, gosh, great question. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, so a couple of things right now. If you go to kaboom.org, just you can see the map of playful cities. You can see where they're located. You can see some really interesting content that's shared on there. Um, we, we do view our role, as I said, as, as that of a clearinghouse to, to bring forth what, what ideas we have. Um, that's one thing. We are working on the development of a playability index. We've done uh, testing in 22 cities right now. Uh, we're going to not share that publicly yet, but we want to bring that data to the cities that will be at our summit. And they helped uh, sort of shape uh, that quantitative and qualitative survey that we did to understand how that information will be helpful to them and then ultimately how we think it can inspire some healthy competition. We are assuming that it's going to be a very helpful tool. Uh, we've trademarked that index. We're looking for funding, hint, hint, uh, to really expand that over the years to make it um, something like Walk Score that becomes part of people's decisions about where to live and why to live there and is, is informative to and beneficial to folks at, at the city level. We. Um, on the whole playability uh, pillar for Kaboom, have moved uh, far into the thought leader space um, and will do more and more of what you see here, convenings uh, and, and, and um, bringing together folks around innovation. We're planning four different events next year that will uh, get the right thinkers together in the room um, to to spark ideas and to and we have many interesting ways with some of our social media partners and media partners to think about how we spread <coughs> that word um, so those are just some of the um, uh, specifics of what we plan to do to advance playability um, obviously it's somewhat capacity uh, dependent and funding dependent and we're in the midst of that change for Kaboom right now as we, we build toward the capacity we need to do this and it's not us. We're not. This is not about our brand at all. Uh, we're we're a nonprofit, and we will never grow this brand. But what we can do with the right partners is, as you said, work toward the ultimate over a generation, ultimate the, the norm change that um, we think we can achieve. And that's going to take the the work of of all the different kinds of things I described, and the efforts of, of all of you in the room, leaders uh, in in a space and in industry that are thinking. About play, so thank you for the question. Another question. I'll, I'll let I'll let you choose since you have the mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm curious to know, and I guess this is mainly for um, Mayor Baker or for Sally, what the 
playable cities have been able to accomplish in terms of more of a culture change. So I see impacts on accessibility and building play environments and making those changes, but have those cities then gone sort of inside of schools and to try to do any sort of reformation in terms of bringing more play into educational content and, and addressing recess kind of issues, or is this more of a you know, land kind of use? No, actually, we've, we've brought this into schools. There, the PTA came in front of us and asked for a contribution to replace a, uh, a playground in uh, one of our elementary schools. And uh, that's, I think, how we first got involved with Kaboom, in that we wanted to do a community build. We wanted to, uh, to help the school uh, and, and uh, make sure that that playground was open. Uh, on the weekends for the community. And so um, I, one of the people that was involved is now on our city council. We just appointed her a couple of months ago. And uh, there is another school that a public park is actually their playground in our community. And uh, they use it during recess and we have it all the rest of the time. So we try to work with the schools and we try to, to to help them and utilize their playground space as ours and theirs as uh, as uh, is ours. So I'm just going to jump in and say, if you're looking at like, impact measurement around playability, I can't speak for the entire playability city, but I can certainly speak for the Healthy Cities project that we've been funding in three markets. That using the Insights program out of Kaboom and our other partner, Feeding America, we're actually measuring families' responses responses to health questions. So we're looking at kids who are now using the, the physical structure of a playground that may have been developed in a community, but we're actually asking them about healthy behaviors on the whole part of the family. So we are looking at larger outcomes than, okay, you showed up and you went down the slide six times, right? So we're not, I'm not going to be able to tell you the individual BMI of a child six months later, but I am going to be able to say that on impact, 500 families who have access to this playground now look at health issues from this way. And again, that's because for us, we're trying to integrate this with bigger themes, but I would definitely, I would, I'm guessing somewhere in this universe, there are probably people who are now relating the increase in recess time to academic mm -hmm. success. I know that exists, but you, I don't know if that's something Insights is doing specifically. Yeah, so the other um, way that I'll, I'll answer the question, um, Marilyn, is that, uh, so this is all about the continuum of a child's life. It's, it, you know, kids, kids play on the way to school, kids want to play at school, kids play after school. Um, so there are fabulous examples, um, including Chicago. Chicago is a playful city where uh, the mayor has uh, declared as part of his playful city initiative that, um, that there will be uh, playgrounds within a 10 minute walk for every kid that recess will be mandatory, um, a whole whole range of, of issues like that. And New York is a playful city, uh, probably the largest city in our constellation. And you have seen all the things that have been happening with Mayor de Blasio uh, and the push for uh, early childhood learning, um, which of course for pre-K is play. I mean, that's, that's the curriculum for pre-K, pre so. Thank you so much. Uh, we would love to have more questions. Uh, uh, Sally, you do have a video I think you wanted to show. We we do. Okay, can you go ahead and run that? Do you want to make a statement first? Or yes, this is, uh, this is a message from uh, our CEO and founder, Daryl Hammond. Sorry I couldn't be there with you in person. I really uh, regret uh, that I couldn't make it across the country. But I'm delighted that this is the second anniversary of the World Congress of Play and that even more people are gathering to talk about this important topic, this growing topic, that play really does matter. That the more and faster we build playable communities that families and kids can actually thrive in by playing more, uh, the better the world that we're going to be able to uh, create. Uh, I want to thank Richard and Charlie for their great leadership. Um, for taking on the challenge of merging industry and advocacy um, together to make that a, a very powerful equation. Um, not just talking about uh, growing our market share of businesses, but actually growing our market share of kids playing in a balance uh, in all types of ways um, so that they can um, thrive. Uh, I know you're going to have a great conversation and discussion uh, with my colleagues. 
Um, I look forward to hearing the results of it. Thanks for working together to give kids the childhood they deserve. We'll go further faster by collaborating, partnering, and really building a crescendo um, towards making sure that kids get the play that they need to be able to thrive. Thanks and have a great session.